So what happened here was the 8-pin or 8-2 sprocket pushed the bar back to the point where it was really out of the groove, to the point where it was not oiling effectively. So um, should have changed to a 7 anyway because that's a long bar. The saw has the power to pull it, but basically I had to go to a 7 so I can get the bar back up into where it's oiling. But also it's easier to take the bar on and off with a 7 than an 8. And since I'm going to move this saw into the large 36 inch bar world, um, going to a 7 makes sense anyway. So it's something that had to happen. But it also explains why it wasn't oiling as well as I would have liked with the, with the other bars as well, with the 8 pin. Just pretty much everything about a big long bar means uh, more to have to wrestle with, you know. So yeah, for some, that's good. Use a big bar if you need one. And this saw, after a brief experiment with the bigger bars, I'm going to bring it back to a 20 because it really suits what I do here better. Again, I want lighter easier to manipulate and since the bucking the logs that I've drugged down with the tractor are always going to be full of mud uh, sharpening up a, a longer chain versus the shorter chain just doesn't make any sense here at all. I'm not getting anything from that operation at all. So the 28 inch bar is coming off for this operation because I have some trees to drop and then it's going to go back on as a backup on the big tree sushi operation I'm going to do a little bit later today or tomorrow. Because in that operation I'm going to need a long bar. Now I've run this saw with the 24 and the light 24 is really not a bad option. You've seen that quite a bit. But I'm going to go back to a 20. I'll leave bling saw for bucking operations with the longer. But the this almost looks stubby now. Not used to seeing it with a 20, but it's really what I need, you know. It's, it's what I need for around here, you know. A little bit lighter weight. This is a fairly fresh chain too, so. But for most of what I do for the size trees, I can get from both sides of a tree, you know. And um, this is really the best setup for me, the best all-around saw. A 70 cc saw of this power class, and there's a lot of them out there that are really nice but with a 20 inch bar for basically being light, handy, maneuverable, you know. You know, it seems like every couple of years we got to go through this whole rediscovery thing where, you know, somebody out there uh, decides that some configuration is the best thing for sliced bread for them. And then the whole community follows it in, uh, and so I, you know, I'm always one of those people where I'll try anything. I don't really have any pride in, 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 uh, in this. It's just basically whatever works best for me. And I'd say now going on 20 years since I've been sort of a saw enthusiast versus just a person who uses them as a tool, I've gone around the block on this, what size bar do you need? And for my operations, I always come back to this. And, you know, it's easier on my back because I'm working on the ground often or working uh, pretty low to the ground. And it's easier to work in the brush where I have to work around tight spaces where there's other trees and things like that in the mix. I think it's easier on the saw because when I get stuck or something like that, I don't have a long leverage working on the case. It's lightweight, it's handy, more available power to cut. Um, when I get into the mud, it takes less time to sharpen the chain because there's less teeth to sharpen, 72 versus 84 or 93. And, uh, but the lightweight factor, the handy factor, those are the ones that really bring me back to the 20 inch bar for my applications. You know, and I'm not doing this just talking out of my ass. 
It's just a matter of I try all the different configurations and you know everybody has a different opinion of what works for them and mine I always come back to that configuration right here. Boom. And that saw and that bar will do 90% of what I need to do on the farm and I don't have to carry as much weight. I don't have to sharpen as many teeth. Um, it's not as expensive if I rock a chain. It doesn't give as much torque on the saw cases themselves when I get stupid. And uh, overall, it's a better solution for me. Bling saws from State 24. I like it. By the way, it has a square ground chain. Young fellow who's buying the firewood is into sharpening the chain, which is another point I want to make. Is there are people who make a big issue about, you know, square ground, this and that, and everything else. And what I found is, if I've got clean wood, spending the time to sharpen a chain can, can pay off, and it's a lot of fun. But when I'm out there just bowing it, trying to get the trees out, and I'm dealing in the mud, I'm dealing with the tractors, I'm skidding, doing the tops, and it's dirty, and it's muddy like you see on the video, that uh, square ground chain, uh, they, they, sharp, they, they cut really good you know, in the beginning, but the first time I get them in the dirt, boy, they, they get dull fast. So sometimes it's better for me to sacrifice initial cut speed in order to be able to continue working over a period of time because if I'm out there slogging in the mud, I really don't have time to, to sharpen the chain, so I'd rather have one that'll cut something even if it's not in perfect condition. Yet again, smaller bar, you know, standard chain, Maybe doesn't cut quite as snappy when I first put it in the log, but after an hour or two and a couple of tanks of gas, it's still cutting wood. You know what I'm saying? Semi chisels were really designed for that, and I haven't gone to semi chisel because I found that the steel RS or the uh, the old LGX now ELX chains they 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 last long enough, and basically I got to come up and out anyway by the time that they're dull to the point where I can't use them. So to the whole argument that the right way of doing things is a longer bar and a really, really well sharpened chain, I'd say that makes a lot of sense if, if you're going to drop a tree and buck it right there. And uh, it's a big diameter tree and it's, it's a softer wood and you don't have to deal with the dirt. But the very second that you have hardwood and mud and uh, you're, you're bucking up skidded logs or topping trees that have been drug around, well then that whole sharpness thing goes away in a hurry because the first five minutes of cutting you've hit something and now you have a dull chain and now instead of having 72 links to sharpen you've got 84 or 93 you know what I'm saying or more if it's a if it's a longer bar so it just doesn't make any sense to me it, it, it really doesn't for my world but I see that some of the guys out west they drop these big furs and they're standing on top of them they're reaching down they're bucking them and it's clean wood well, obviously having a longer bar and a sharper chain makes all the sense in the world out there. Just different worlds, you know. And uh, for my fun saws, like I, with that saw right there, the, the 562 bling saw, we are going to experiment with different chain sharpening techniques. I'm going to let a, a person show off their technique some. And I'm going to try to keep it out of the production world and keep it into the fun world. And it'll make sense to have a nice longer 24 inch bar or even a 28. It'll make sense in that world. It'll be fun. That's what it's about. So I'm going to expand on that concept just a little more about why the 20 inch bar with a shorter chain works for me. And um, again, for me, the lightest weight saw with enough power to do the job is the one that's right for me. And the shortest bar I can get away with because as you'll see in a few minutes, I'm in the brush. So having a longer bar, I have to manipulate it around trees that are next to trees. Sure, I try to cut out enough to work, but oftentimes it's just a lot of stuff in there for me to work around. It's interesting watching guys with the big saws and long bars complain about having back problems. <laughs> it just kills me. And uh, everybody has, if you're, if you're living the life that most of the people who watch my channel or are interested in the things that I'm interested in are living, Everyone has scar stories, you know? Everybody has catastrophic injury stories. It's just statistically what's gonna happen. It's not a matter of if you're gonna get hurt, it's when and how bad. I've had a few myself. Now I put a few 
clips on the channel back in, I don't know, 2018 where I had a hip replacement. And that was because of many years of racing dirt bikes. Well, you'd think that the dirt bike racing would have created the worst injuries in my life. No. I've hit the ground, I've bounced my head off of things, I've crashed and all kinds of stuff over 20 years of racing dirt bikes. But the two worst injuries I ever had um, were based on tractors, working around tractors and things. And it wasn't getting run over or anything like that. It's just one of them, uh, which was probably the most influential injury in my life, was logging it in the mud and being on a hillside and stepped out of my tractor and slipped off the steps into the cab and my arm got hung. And I dropped and my arm was stuck up there. So it basically tore out my shoulder and did a complete tear of my pectoral muscle. That thing fell right down to here. None of the surgeons around here even want to touch it. Fortunately, I ran into a guy uh, up in Syracuse, New York, SOS, uh, Syracuse Orthopedic Surgeons, a guy named Todd Battaglia. Shout out to him because he basically saved my life. Who was willing to take on that repair? They called it a weightlifter's tear, where it was a complete separation of the pectoral muscle from the connective tissue. It was a t complete tear. And they did surgery. They were mostly successful. And he said, funny, I said, uh, how do I know if it's good? He goes, well, it's 50-50 chance. And so I pushed further. And I said, okay, what do I know if i got a problem? He goes, well, you'll feel good one minute, and the next minute you won't. So that advice kind of guided a lot of my activities for a couple of years past that, which is one of the reasons why I don't do dirt bikes anymore. Chainsaws have to take the place, boats have to take the place of the two-stroke and motorsports itch. So everyone has them. I've got them too. And um, yet again, because of the injuries I've had and because of the experiences I've had, I always go back to trying to find ways of allowing me to extend my time out here longer. And um, when somebody has an idea, I'm always willing to explore it because I definitely take the approach that uh, I'm not the expert, I'm the person who can learn from others. And on this channel, I t try to take the approach of just sharing the experiences. So yeah, with a history of some rather catastrophic injuries from complete reconstruction up here, an attachment of a, a very important muscle, the te pectoral muscle. If I didn't have it, I wouldn't be able to use this arm in a logging operation. Hip replacements and some other things. Yeah, I've been around. I've been around that block. And uh, yet again, I end up looking for the lightest possible saw and the smallest possible package for me to manipulate to do the work I do. In the, my ultimate old man saw really is pretty close to that with a speed cut 20 inch bar and it's really a Husky 560. I built it out of a 555 but basically it's a 562 top end ignition all that on a stuffer crank in the small amount uh, cases that are typical of a 555 and a 560. And uh, I haven't run that saw in a while because I feel good and when I f feel good I like to run saws I prefer to run because there's always that element of fun. You know what I'm saying? And I had fun with the 562, partly because I built it, partly because it's just snappy. By the way, somebody was showing another Autotune style saw that was a little bit boggy off the bottom. That saw is not. It, it instantly jumps to RPM. So the idea that on an Autotune or a computer uh, controlled saw is going to come off idle slowly is false. And I can show you with that saw. This one here is a little bit, it's not quite as snappy for a lot of reasons. Oftentimes it's due to, it's due to flywheel weight, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, where I was going with that is the, the net result of my experiences of just absolutely hard-coded, the smaller is better, the lighter is better, assuming there's enough power concept. And where I was going was, as the season goes on, the temperatures drop, the fun factor begins to cloud the practical factor and this one will go back into hiding and my other saws will come out whether it's a built saw for like a whether it's a built 372 or one of my um, vintage saws like those L77 Husqvarna's are really cool so I'll probably bring them back into service and the decision is not based on whether they're practical they beat the odds and all that kind of stuff that typically drives a person it's just because I want to and 
while I still can, I'd rather run a saw like that, even though it's heavier and doesn't cut as fast, because it's fun for me. I find satisfaction in that. It has nothing to do with being practical, but what it does do, uh, what, what it does have to do with is bringing a little joy into something that normally would be work. So if I can blend enough fun with the things that are, are, are work oriented, I have to do, well, then instead of coming out here and busting my ass and being tired and thinking of it as work, it's a matter of me testing my saws and I have fun with them, and it's something I look forward to doing. It's a mental gymnastics thing. But net, net, net is when it's, when it's summertime and it's hot, I have to get stuff down. Lighter is better. It's either ultimate old man saw or saw like this or one of those 48 millimeter builds for me. But as the temperatures go down and my ability to hang on to the bigger saws goes up, well then these get put away and I start putting in either a project saw or I start putting in one of my vintage saws like the Home Light 925 or the Husky L77s or the John Thread uh, 920s and things like that because that adds a fun factor into what would be a normally a work day. I hope that kind of clears things up. But um, long bars, they work for people. And I have a hunch that some of the advocates of long bars and some of the other saws, whether they're vintage or steels or whatever, uh, there's a little bit of fun factor in that too, where running them big bars and big saws and all that stuff is fun. It's fun. I have fun with the bling saw. And that's not to be confused with uh, being practical. It's a blend. It's a blend of being fun and practical, which makes the experience uh, enjoyable. And to the guys who buy into it and have fun with it, God bless them. Uh, I'll try it, and, and I do it, and I try to experience it, share the experience. And if I want big and long, ah, it's fun, but it's hard freaking work. And uh, I'm going to run that this, this fall more and more because I want to tweak it a little bit. And, but that's pure fun. It has nothing to do with being practical. Uh, this is practical. You know, That's a blend of practical and fun to the point where it actually works for me in the summertime as well. So this saw here is successful on both fronts. But that's where I'm coming from. And then rather than me trying to say that's the right thing for you, all I'm doing is showing you what I do. And if that maps into your world or you agree, that's good. If it doesn't, fine. Uh, it, I don't have any, any uh, pride. I don't have any, uh, it, there's, it doesn't matter to me. It's just showing you the experience and why I do what I do from my perspective is the goal of the channel. So this is pretty much typical of what I have to deal with in the hedgerow. This is a dead cherry tree, which will make very, very nice firewood. And the guy who's been buying the firewood expressively wanted some cherry. Now there's some stuff down here in the ground I can drag out right now, which is probably good firewood. But I have a bunch of trees in here. And like I was saying, imagine having to swing around a big saw with a long bar in this mess. This area in here, which I have to work, is pretty much case in point of why you want as small a saw as you possibly can get away with. And I've been working out here for decades, you know, taking firewood out of this, this hedgerow. So you've seen a lot of videos. This won't look any different than other ones. But what I need to do is I need to make sure I have an escape place. And that's where I am right now. So I have to clean things up so I can escape. And then I have to do a face cut. I'll do a little bit of a bore cut. And then I'll release it. And then I have to top it and, uh, and uh, throw the, the branches into the, the hedgerow here. So when I'm doing the topping, that's actually a place where my 562 with a longer bar sometimes is an advantage. And um, when I skid it, it's going to get dirt on there. So if I'm bucking with a long bar and chain and I've got all that dirt, by the time I've got through this tree bucking it, it's probably got a dull chain. So now I've got to think about how much I want to sharpen the chain. So anyway, here we go.
Now here's, this situation is a different set of rules. Is I'm going to be limited on the ground and having the extra bar length does keep me from bending over. That's not going to hurt my back because I also have it attached to a fairly lightweight saw in this 562, you know what I'm saying? So I can argue the case here. This pretty much weighs the same as my 70cc saw with a 20 inch bar. And this is a 60cc saw with a 24 inch bar and a little more reach. So I can make the argument that this one here uh, is, is a better saw for what I have to do here, breaking down these branches, you know? It's either that or a small top handle or something like that, you know, a little tiny saw. But yeah, I don't have to bend over as much. That works. And I haven't skidded this log yet, so I don't have to worry about dirt rocking up my chain. But the overwhelming reason why I'll pick this saw over the other saws is it's lightweight and it's fun. The fun factor begins to creep into this. What I need to do is I need to build a couple of like hot 50cc saws with a, a longer bar for this operation here. And uh, Ultimate Old Man Saw has a 20. I don't know if I can get a 24 inch bar on it. I'd have to have a lightweight small mount, maybe a Sujihara or something like that. But that might be a fun concept, you know what I'm saying? Or maybe build up an old 550 and put a long bar on it for this operation. So, but this is a blend of fun as well as being practical. And yeah, I, I could argue the case that this next set of operations, this is a better saw. But. So I always got to clean that mess up so I don't leave it in my hay field. But I have a couple in here I need to get out. Check out that widow maker right there on that little cherry tree. That's coming down. And then behind it is kind of scary a little bit because they're all kind of intertwined and tangled. So I got to come in here and make myself a workspace. You see how that's tangled right there with that branch? So chances are when this tree right here begins to come out, that's coming down too in some rather unstructured way. So what I have to do is cut to where I can exit out the back rapidly. You know what I'm saying? Get this one down and get out of the way as that stuff comes down with it. It might take down some of those dead branches right there. So I have to exit pretty quickly and there's a barbed wire fence in there somewhere so basically it's a mess yeah let's get down here and look a little closer so I got to clean up all this mess right here there's a big woodchuck hole to step into so what I'm thinking is wow what I'm thinking is, what the heck am I thinking? Um, what I think is going to end up happening is, I got to get the cherry out of there. That's the first thing it has to go. Oh, I see. That's going down with it. That's what's tangled. So I may have to take down this locust right here that has all the barbed wire in it. It's dead anyway, so if I drop it out the back, cut through that first, and then cut out this locust which will be firewood. 
I'm going to leave that dead tree. I don't, it's tangled. So it may come down with it anyway. And then I'm going to do a face cut, bore cut, and then back cut and run out that way. So as soon as I think I see it moving, I'm getting the heck out of here. One of the things I see is you see that branch, it heads out that way. When this tr tree falls that way, that branch is going to sweep up and if there's anything dead up there, it has a chance of breaking it, having it come down. And I see one branch right there in the middle of the screen, which is probably a candidate for that. So when I get moving, I got to get moving. I got to get all the way out to the green stuff over there before that tree does that sweep. You know, as I get into the season, I really have to do something about the camera batteries. Because it ran out again while I was in the middle of that mess right there. And there was actually some pretty good video, you know. I had to cut a couple of trees out of the way and to make some room so I can get in there and work around the base of that big old ash. And I did a face cut, right? And then I picked the camera up to see if it was on. It was already out of battery. So, face cut, bore cut. And it's all dead up there. See all that dead stuff? I know stuff is coming down. See that water maker right there? There's a bunch of that in the back. So I'm going to exit rapidly to the left-hand side of that. So when the stuff comes down, hopefully I don't get nailed by it. At least that's the plan. So I had to cut that tree out. Blocked it up in the ground over here. You can see the edge of the face cut. I also did a bore cut. And I see that branch, it goes that way. That's going to sweep up. That's going to sweep up. And that thing there is going to come down, probably. And there might be some things up there that as it goes up and over, it knocks down. So as soon as I see that tree moving, I'm out here. That's a lot of tree right there. And I was able to exit and nothing came down, so that was a safe operation. Do I still have camera? I do. So I got a lot of stuff to drag down to the landing now too. I've got two trees that are cherry. I got one that's honey locust and I got this big old ash tree to drag down there. So Now I do what I always do, and it works for me. That, uh, that stump is a little deceptive, 
because what I do is I did not cut the hinge all the way off. The hinge was right here and right here. But I did bore cut into this area here. So you can see where it was it broke out. My cut, my back cut was up here, but the bore cut was down there. So I only had those two hinge points. I held that one. This was enough to get it going where I wanted it to go. And I don't know. I don't know if I recommend that for everybody. My God, I've done it forever. It works for me. So, all right. I think that's it for the day.